this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts, either through the industry insights, information, or simply learning from them. And today we have Brian Clayton, he's a serial entrepreneur, CEO of GreenPal, and GreenPal is an online platform that connects homeowners with local lawn care professionals and real estate, and he's also a real estate investor. Welcome to the show, Brian. AJ, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. You are welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome to India. And I'm sure not just in India, but across the world, a lot of people, you know, will be able to benefit from the wisdom that you are going to share, wisdom, share, tips, and tricks that you are going to share. So first, from uh, to understand from you, uh, Brian, is that you went into landscaping and then you went to tech with all that learning that you had to do for yourself so why did you take so much of trouble to move from landscaping your company is doing so well even today and then you moved into tech help us understand this part this aspect of you know uh looking at businesses as a serial entrepreneur yeah, it's a great question. So I started mowing grass in high school as a way to make extra money. And little by little, over a 15 year period of time, I ended up building it into a, a real company, ended up building a, a landscaping business with over 150 employees. It was doing around $10 million a year in revenue. And uh, in 2013, uh, a company approached me about buying the business. And I thought, well, uh, I don't really know what I'm going to do after I sell the business, but but I had reached a point where I think I uh, was no longer growing alongside the business. It wasn't like I conquered it or anything like that, but I think if you're doing business right, you as the founder, you as the as the entrepreneur are evolving into a whole new person every two or three years. And so my first business was kind of like that, but I reached the point where I uh, were almost plateaued. So I kind of had this itch to try something new and uh, it came at a good time. And so I sold the business um, in 2013. And then I, I took some time off and I got bored. I started to understand something about myself that I, I was wired as a, per, as a human being to want to be in the game of entrepreneurship, I want, to want to be in the game of running a business. And so I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And I thought, well, I know I know the landscaping business and I saw what Uber and Airbnb were doing uh, at the time of 2012, 2013. And I thought, well, somebody's going to build the Uber for lawn care services. Why? Why can't that be me? And uh, it was kind of naivete as an asset. I didn't really understand how challenging it was going to be. I didn't know how to code, didn't know how to build software. But uh, I recruited two co-founders and we started working on the, the project, the idea that you should be able to order a lawn mowing service just like you order an Uber. And uh, it took about three or four years to get it to work, to get people to use it. But now GreenPal is a 10 year, 11 year overnight success. Uh, we're nationwide in the United States with about 300,000 people using the app every day to get their grass cut. Right, Brian. Right. So, was was it because it was much grass was much more greener on the other side, from peach tree to you know uh, to green pal? Hel help us understand because was it was it just the uh, lure of money, or did you find that tech has to come into whatever you are doing? So you moved from peach tree to uh, to green pal, and why did you take this step? Though though you understand. It involved a lot of learning for yourself. And you know, so I want to understand two things for the entrepreneurs is that how do you decide when to move on from one business to another? And second is that if you don't know things about one particular line, because landscape is different and tech is different and you know, it's a different sort of a line and where where you know about things but it's like a marketplace so how what can, what is it that will help you decide this if you know nothing about the new venture and you are uh, and, and uh, something old is something you are much more confident about how did uh, you decide about this what was your motivation what were the what would you like uh, wisdom you would like to tell a lot of entrepreneurs who are just looking at the entrepreneurial step and don't know 
where to move, which side to move, even if it's a lucrative market. It's a great question, AJ. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you made me chuckle because that's exactly how I felt. I thought the grass was greener on the other side. I Here's what I here's literally what I felt. I, I had a 150 employee business. I sold it. Running that business every day was like organized chaos. It was different fires everywhere and it was really challenging to run. I sold it. I took a deep breath. I was like, whew, that was really tough. I don't want to do anything that hard again. I want to start a software business because that will be easier. And boy, I didn't know what I didn't know. I quickly learned that a software business is 10 times harder than running a traditional brick and mortar, blue collar type of business. And so I thought the grass was greener on the other side, but I was quickly confronted with the reality that it's a lot harder than it looks. You know, you watch a movie like The Social Network or something like that, and all of the hard parts about building the business are set to the background of like a photo montage or a musical montage. And in like the actual like uh, process of building a technology business from scratch is actually quite hard and boring. So that was something that conf- that I was confronted with. I had to learn the hard way, but we just kept going. We we made little small goals, and we you know we started off with ten customers, and then we got a hundred, and then we turned a hundred into a thousand, and then we wanted to turn that with one thousand into five thousand, and kept building on little successes and learning from our failures. And as we did that, I began to understand that. While a software business is 10 times harder, you can actually have 10 times to 100 times to 1,000 times the impact because software scales. And now, now 10 years later, we've got a product that hundreds of thousands of people were using uh, to get something done, whereas in my last business, it was maybe hundreds of people. You know, maybe we had a thousand customers at our peak, but now my current business has has three hundred thousand customers. So, on the one hand, a software business is ten times harder, uh, mainly because you're inventing a brand new product from scratch that does not exist yet in the world, and there is no roadmap. There is no thing that you can copy. You just kind of have to figure it out as you go, just through trial and error. Whereas a traditional business like my landscaping company. You know, I was I was learning from bigger competitors. I would go to different cities and study how other competitors were running their business and how bigger companies were running their business and borrowing and using best practices. It was kind of a straightforward strategy. Starting GreenPal, there was no Uber for lawn care. So we had to make up the, the plan as we went. And that's actually an order of magnitude harder than running a traditional business. So uh, I'm glad we didn't give up. We just stuck it out, and the first four or five years were really tough. But it's been much more rewarding than than my first business because we're able to put our hard work into the hands of more and more people. So I think it's a lot more fun. And the other thing is, to, to your second question, is uh, one thing you learn starting a technology business is that you not to believe your own BS. You know, you, you may not have the title of engineer. You may not have the title of designer. You may not have the title of copywriter or, or digital marketer or growth hacker. But guess what? You're going to have to learn all of these things. And you quickly come to find out that you can learn anything. You can become like 80, 20 good at pretty much anything you set your mind to. Yeah, you may not have been good at math in college, but you can become a pretty good engineer uh, just through taking online classes. And so that's one thing I learned uh, starting GreenPal that I didn't learn in my first business was that you can learn these skills that you've got to learn to, to be in the game of running a tech business. Uh, and, and, and what a great time to start a business because you can learn them all online for free. And so, so I, learned, uh, I learned that it was harder than it looks. I learned that it was a lot more challenging, but I also learned not to believe my own BS and to just get in there and figure it out. And uh, it takes time, but the, the only way to win is by not giving up. Absolutely. Absolutely, Brian. So in terms of reading and learning, and because today there is so much of stuff available online, so even to decide or to make a decision about what to learn, and that also needs a learning what, how did you decide what you needed to learn? Because internet is a very vast space. All things that you just log into the internet and it is 
you can just you know lose the weight so yeah. what would you like to tell people you know to keep about keeping focus when they are trying to learn something on the internet when you are, when they have to find a found a company like green pal how does that work it may sound simple but sometimes even i lose focus and i just go on reading something else to something else to something else and i forget that two hours have passed how does it actually work when you are really serious about building something yeah it's 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 a great question aj because i think half the battle is just wading through all of the stuff that's not so great and and stumbling upon the the material that is good that can help you uh and 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 that that a lot of times you can get discouraged because maybe you wasted money on a course that wasn't very good or you wasted two or three hours watching right. a, a, a webinar that wasn't very helpful. And so that's the first thing is is just understanding that, you know, a third of the time is going to be kind of consuming a lot of the stuff and then doubling down on on the actual sources of information that that resonate with you that help you get from from point a to point b so that's 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 step one step two is it's like it's like when you're starting a startup uh what you're learning is almost like block and tackling for whatever stage of the game you're in it's almost like you're triaging around what is the most important thing this week this month and uh it, and so it's like there might be 20 things that you need to learn, but really one or two are the priority. And so day one, starting GreenPal, you know, we needed to build a usable prototype. And uh, and we tried to pay somebody to do it, and that was a, a, a total failure. So we had to learn how to write software. And so we, we, we chopped it up. I took the front end, and my, my co-founder took the back end, and we just learned everything we could about, about how to actually write code. And so th- it really wasn't necessary to do anything else other than just trying to find the best resources for me on front end development and for my, my co-founder uh, on back end development and, and not worry about anything else. And so we did that for about a year and we became pretty good at, 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 at building software so much so that we could then maybe fold in a developer or two and know how to delegate to them because we were doing it ourselves. And then so step two was, okay, you know, we've got a hundred customers that, that we've hustled up this through door hangers and flyers, but we really need to get to a thousand. So now we need to learn how are we going to put this product in the hands of people that need it? And, and how are we going to be good at, at digital marketing? And not only that, but what's the one channel we're going to really focus on? And, and we, we, so then we started to learn about different channels, you know, social media marketing, Google paid uh, AdWords, a search engine optimization, things like that. And, and, and after we keyed in on organic search is going to be our best ca- uh, channel, we didn't do anything else other than study and reverse engineer how other people were, were succeeding in search and really formulate our game plan and learn how to how to be good search engine optimization practitioners and didn't worry about anything else. And then maybe six, seven, eight months later, I began to understand that, wow, copy is really important. The words on the screen are really important. Uh, I want to be a decent copywriter so I can know what good copy looks like and what, what bad copy looks like. So I, I took six months and read, read every book I could get my hands on copywriting, took every course that, that I could to, on, on copywriting. So I think it's really almost like an emergency room where, you know, if you go to the emergency room, uh, you might there might be people that get there after you that get service before you because their situation is more dire than yours. Well, starting a startup is kind of like that. And, and what you decide to spend your time on is, is like that. It's, it's really focusing your firepower on one or two things at a time. Right, right. Now, tell us about this two-sided marketplace. Because I know about marketplace, I don't know what is a two-sided marketplace. And secondly, in the tech world today, there are so many businesses online that it is very competitive to acquire, you know, uh, uh, customers. And if you, so how, how does that work? How did that work for you? What are the tips that you'd like to share with, uh, with the audience who are many of whom are entrepreneurs in terms of, you know, user acquisition, how does that work on, especially online users? Yeah, there's a, there's a saying that, uh, first time founders worry about product, uh, meaning what the product they're building, what does it do? And that second time founders worry about distribution. 
And so it's kind of like if you've been through it, maybe you try you you, you tried something and failed, or you maybe you had a little bit of success. You understand that the, if you ever do this again, that really the product and what it does is table stakes. What really matters and what is actually twice as hard is how are we going to get customers and people to use the product at some sort of price that we can afford to pay. And uh, that's actually a, a lot harder than just building the product in the first place. And, and, and we, you know, we learned that the hard way with GreenPow. We, we built this, this product that took us a year to build. And it, we, we, we realized if you build it, they won't come. And we started to really understand, okay, wow, we got to the top of this uh, peak but now we, we realize that there's another peak that we have to climb that's, that's twice as tall. And that is how do we get people to use this thing? And not only that, but we've got two customers. So we have a two-sided marketplace. We've got lawn care services that provide the lawn mowing service. And we've got consumers that want to order those services. So we have to kind of get them both to the party at the same time. And not only that, we have to do all of that at a local level, city by city. So, so these these local based two sided marketplaces are really challenging to to get going because there's a liquidity problem that exists in every single city. And there's a good book by this uh, about this uh, by Andrew Chen called The Cold Start Problem. And he talks about how a lot of startups got over this. You know how we got over it was we we focused on on getting a uh, one city, so Nashville, Tennessee, where we're, where we're from, just one city, and and we got the first uh, 50 service providers onto the platform just just by hand to hand combat, calling them, meeting with them, uh, pitching them on the idea of what this thing is going to become, and then we focused on the consumers. I don't believe you can boil the ocean, so to speak, and get both at the same time. You have to like focus on one, and then and then and then get the other to the party. And that's how we did it. And then after we got a little playbook, we started rolling it out city by city uh, throughout the United States. And it took a long time because we had to build every city from the ground up. But uh, but it, now we have a durable marketplace that uh, that is humming and, and, and growing in, in, in the top cities in the United States. Right. Right, Brian. So what should be the biggest trend? What uh, in terms of is it about better customer experience? Is it about pricing and second thing is when you entered this business and so you knew that you belong to this place but when did you feel that okay it is now even this this particular tech industry also you know wants us to belong to this place when you got uh, uh, sure about your place in that industry how does one know that okay this is here i am established now and i am here for the long haul because that that strength only comes because not not just what because some money is coming in, but maybe there is something more to it. You'll be able to tell us about that. Yeah, it's a really good question. So, so is is it about price or is it about better customer experience? One, one of my favorite uh, quotes is by Jeff Bezos, and he says, "The thing I love about the customer is that they are divinely discontent." And so what he means by that is that they are always, always looking for the best, fastest, cheapest solution. And, and like today's innovation is yesterday's old news. Like it like it, like it always has to get better, faster, cheaper, uh, more delightful, more more convenient. And, and, and we've spent 10 years in one thing. How do you make ordering a lawn mowing service as easy as t touching a button? So so the truth is, it really is both. But maybe one matters more than the other. And, and for us, we thought when we first launched the app that it was all about price because I came to the equation uh, and I came to the starting block from the contractor perspective. You know, I had spent 15 years as a contractor. And if you run a, a, a contracting business or an agency, you know, you kind of get jaded where you think, man, the only thing customers care about is price, 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 price. And, uh, and, and, and they're going to hire the cheapest person they can no matter what. So that's how we oriented the app. But as time went on, we, we started talking to the first hundred thousand, you know, the first thousand people that were using the app to order lawn mowing services. And they would tell us, you know, we would ask them, you know, what's the most important thing when you're considering which, which lawn mowing service to use on our app? And they would say, yeah, price is important, but I just want the damn guy to show up on the day he's supposed to. 
that it actually the main part of the value proposition was not necessarily the cheapest lawn mowing service that 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 the, that the pain that they were experiencing was being flaked and ghosted and and let down by by other service providers and in that if we could just build the app to make sure the service shows up on thursday when he or she is supposed to that that solves a bigger pain point it doesn't matter that it's five dollars cheaper it's actually the reliability and that was a big insight for us that we wouldn't have gotten had we not taken the time to talk to our first 50 100 500 customers you know we 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 uh we would buy them dinner at restaurants, buy them coffee at Starbucks. We would we would meet them at their kitchen cap table to talk to them about how what how their experience was using our app, and 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 how they thought about hiring lawn mowing services and what was important to them. And had we not done that, we might have spent five or ten years on on price when price actually wasn't the most important thing for us. And so that's how we uh, how we stumbled upon that. And and I think. Uh, I think these days you have to be good at all at all at everything but but actually you know you know Amazon a lot of times is not the most cheapest uh, way to buy a certain right. product you can get on eBay or Alibaba and 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 buy it there but but it may show up 2 weeks later you know it may it may be counterfeit you know it may may not be high quality and though know, Amazon might be 10% more but at least you know it's going to be good and so I think you kind of have to stumble upon that by talking to your customers. But for us, it was a combination of both, but but reliability being the most important. That's that's a very important point you talk about reliability because uh, people keep their si time aside only for that activity. And then somebody hosts you, then your whole day is gone and you are not able to plan and the work still remains undone. So that, that's, right. that's a very, very important point. Coming to another important point, Brian, is the role of data. There is so much of data about everything available, even of your own business. You look at your phone, even your phone will give you so many data. Every app will give you all the data. And Google will also tell you from you went from one room in your house to another room in your house. Everything is all about data. How do you utilize data the correct way to for your business growth? Help us understand that. Yeah, it uh, so it it evolves, right? And so I think in the early days, what hangs a lot of new startups, what hangs them up is they want to go straight to leveraging data, and they want to go straight to uh, looking at dashboards and straight to uh, plotting things out on a graph when they only have like ten or fifty customers, like. No, you need more customers. You need to be spending that time talking to customers. So then you can generate the data. And so most new founders want to sit behind the laptop and stare at the data and try to get some kind of insight. When in fact, you know, to get from zero to one, to get through the first couple of levels of the game, you need to be talking to customers. I think the first hundred sales need to be hand cranked. And then so then you can start creating the data around their behavior, what they're looking for, what makes them uh, churn out, what what delights them. And so that's that's one thing I'll start with. After you've kind of hand cranked your way through the first couple levels of the game and now you're starting to generate some data, uh, I, what I like is to use a combination of of data informed and also customer feedback informed. So it's kind of a qualitative like this is what people are telling us. This is what I'm hearing when I talk to people who use it. Uh, and then this is what the data is saying and then letting that letting that kind of synthesize how we make decisions. Um, and so so for us, you know, we use data now 10 years in the first three, the first couple of years, you know, it was very much uh, hand to hand combat and going off of our gut because we didn't have a whole lot of data. But now now we use data in all kinds of ways. You know, how do we make sure that uh, that the that the that the service is showing up on the day they're supposed to? Well, we use data for the ones that don't that have a poor reliability rating uh, to not get any new business. Like this person is not reliable. So let's, let's demote them out of the platform. And so, so no, more customers don't have a bad experience with this person. So we use that data to figure out who we promote and who we demote. Uh, so that's an internal way that we use data. An external way that we use data is we ingest all of this data about what's going on in the lawn mowing business and then we use that kind of uh exhaust uh from from the activity of the platform 
and package it in a way that's that's important to people searching for a lawn mowing business. So so let's say you live in you know Chicago, Illinois. You want to know how much does it cost to get my lawn mowed? Well, we've got thousands of transactions uh, around how much it costs to get your lawn mowed in every zip code in Chicago. So now we can surface that data to you, the, the consumer, that nobody else has, and 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 we use that as a as a way to attract you as a customer. So we use data internally to make things run smoother, uh, and then we use data externally to to attract more customers. Right, Brian. Right. Uh, there is so much to learn from you. My last question on this is we talked about uh, data, we talked about social media, we talked about reading. What is it that is not about these things, but what is the role of a gut feeling uh, in terms of entrepreneurship? Because that is something that is very intrinsic, very natural. So what is the role of gut feeling in decision making? Have you ever made it the prime factor to decide about things sometimes? How should an entrepreneur look at their gut feeling vis-a-vis -vis all those things that are available in terms of, you know, on their, uh, on, on their laptop? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a good question because, you know, it's like, uh, you know, on the one hand, you know, the best entrepreneurs have that, that good intuition. They have that, uh, what Naval Ramikot calls specific knowledge. And so specific knowledge is all of your experience, everything you've learned rolled into your intuition. And it's something that, that you know that most people don't know. And it could even be a secret that you know about a certain marketplace or industry that most people don't know because you have the specific knowledge. And uh, it's better to be like like 20% uh, good at like five or 10 things than like 100% good at one thing because because then you can like – borrow from all these different uh, uh, domains and combine them into what your specific knowledge is. And so for me, I, I, I have specific knowledge as it relates to running a lawn mowing business at a pretty big scale and how technology can make that better for, for smaller service providers. It's one thing that I know that most people don't. And so that develops an intuition where you can make decisions quicker, you can make better decisions. Uh, but it can also get you in trouble because there's been a lot of times where my gut was wrong. Right. And, and so, and so you want to combine that with the data that you have as time goes on and to make better decisions and to kind of course correct your thinking. And so I've had to undo some decisions I've made because, because I, I didn't let the data speak. It's like, uh, so, so you can go to a meeting and say, well, if we're not going to let the, the data make the decision and we're just going to go with opinions, well, then let's at least use mine. And, and it's like, you don't want to be making decisions that way. So it's a combination of a talented founder that has specific knowledge about a certain combination of things that enables them to make intuitive decisions quickly and also innovative decisions, things that, that don't yet exist, um, combined with the ability to leverage data to, to tune that and to make sure that we're not making a bad decision. Right, right. You, there is, as I said earlier, there is so much to learn from a serial entrepreneur like you, Brian. So what is the best way, you know, people can connect with you so that they can learn directly from you? And also, if anyone, any company, any of your business providers, they want to connect with you professionally and get professionally engaged with you. How does that work? Yeah, anybody listening to this in the United States that doesn't want to mow their yard or wants to participate on our platform, you can just go to greenpal.com and sign up there. And anybody that wants to engage with me, I share some thoughts on Instagram. You can just go to Instagram. Uh, my handle is Brian M. Clayton. Connect with me there. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for all the wisdom in terms of entrepreneurship and how to build a multi-dollar business like you multi-million dollar business like you so with these words of wisdom it's a wrap on this very special edition of the KJ masterclass live thank you so much indeed for joining us